good morning and good afternoon good evening based on wherever you are located today i will be talking about as a continuation of the soil water plant relations which was uh, uh, the topic of the first lecture i am continuing how that information of soil plant water relations is utilized while deciding the number 1 the placement of drip lines in the field number 2 the placement or selection of drip lines with the correct uh, dripper to dripper spacing and number 3 deciding the discharge rate of the dripper these three steps are very critical in the designing as well as field implementation of drip irrigation system now it is important in two different ways one what is our objective our objective is to wet give wetness in the soil equivalent to the evapotranspiration rate of the crop so that the crop will grow it to its full potential and yield to its full potential without water stress and added to that nutrient stress at any point in time in in its life now to achieve this the soil has to be uniformly wetted wherever the rhizosphere the roots are located of the crops now this is an interesting thing actually this whole thinking was not available or not considered seriously during the early phase of the technology of drip irrigation being introduced it is not just keeping the drip tubes randomly at random spacing or spacing as thought of by the design engineer or by the trader for example because for example in india most of the drip irrigation initial drip irrigation installations and even the material brought from overseas are done by traders who may not have much idea either engineering knowledge or agronomic knowledge of the relation between drip irrigation system and the crop geometry now the second aspect the first aspect i told you is the excess plastic being utilized and plants have probably plant rows have no relation to the line of drip line drip line space and spacing provided in the field now this is the first correction which is done when for example chain irrigation get got into the business of manufacturing and uh, providing drip irrigation systems to the uh, to the farmers in india first and to a lot of other developing countries uh, later now the result is that it's not only the crop gets its evapotranspiration requirement met the cost of the system has uh, come down drastically a third aspect is that additional or excess excess use of plastic or excess dumping of plastic material in the field was avoided is avoided the plants have to get the the plant members in a crop has to get appropriate moisture and nutrition so the system has to be optimized the placement of drip line placement of drippers and the decision on the emission rate of the drippers have to be scientifically optimized now we will see through using some examples how this thing came into the uh, to the current status where this optimization has yielded a lot of uh, positive results to the system user as well as the system provider and the country at large in terms of water use in terms of fertilizer use in terms of crop yield Okay, as usual, I repeat uh, just the background which I have uh, in the uh, in this area. I did my PhD in crop water relations, actually, 
the topic I've been re dealing, I was dealing with the last lecture and I'm um, continuing to deal with. And then over a period of time, I have the experience of adapting drip fertigation system in the cultivation of some 52 different crops, mostly in India and the countries in uh, overseas also. So much so that now the crop, if you ask a crop which is not suitable for drip fertigation technology, the answer is nil. All the crops, including rice crops, which used to stand in water, is been adapted uh, through the uh, this technology. So the technology is adapted to that crop. That's what we actually do. Now let us look at the way irrigation technology. And I am talking about the field application of water to an agriculture or a horticulture field. Initially, we used to have just um, cut, cutting the bund, the lowest uh, photograph in this uh, in the photo at the bottom. At the bottom, we have just cut open the uh, bund and the water from the canal just rises into the soil. That's what the irrigation was. Then, with the advancement in science, we have some regulated flow, like water is pumped and allowed to flow through furrows, and the crops will stand on the ridges. You can see. Then we have again refined to have the drip tubes on each of the ridge or on each of the bed, the, 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 um, the second picture of the top. And that is spreading the water beautifully based on the soil texture and based on the discharge and based on the um, dripper to dripper distance. And finally, we have arrived at the subsurface drip irrigation system where the drip tubes are not on the surface, you can't see them because they are buried at a specific depth below the soil. And uh, just for the photographic photograph's sake, I've taken a picture when the water actually comes from bottom and then starts slowly spread. I have just picturized here the progress in technology from uh, simply flooding the field, then to the furrow, then to regulated flow through the pressurized drip irrigation system with the drip, drip lines on the top of the soil, and then they are below the soil, as we call in the subsurface drip irrigation system. This is all very well. But to have a successful drip irrigation system, we should keep the drip lines. We should first select the drip lines with appropriate distance between the two drippers and the appropriate discharge. Then we should keep the drip lines in appropriate distance on the soil, on the soil surface or below the soil surface. There are several issues connected with this. To take this decision, one has to consider several factors. One, which crop and the crops are coming with certain recommendation of their spacing between the two rows in their closely planted crop, or 
in a horticultural tree crop, what's the distance between two rows as well as what's the distance between two trees? These are all already fixed available information in the in the field of agriculture and horticulture. And the farmers or growers or chardits are following this. So in case one, where the row spacing is fixed, then you have to provide drip lines according to the row spacing. This probably is easier. You go to the farm, talk to the farmer, find out what row spacing he is going to plant, and then you provide to the, uh, according to the row spacing, you put the laterals. Now in a tree crop or a bushes, perennials, which live for many years, repeatedly being harvested and then growing, that's what a perennial crop is, it is easier. In fact, the drip irrigation in its origin were at a time only used for such crops. For example, banana, for example, mangoes, pomegranates, grapes, etc. But as it evolved, the technology evolved and uh, online drippers became inline drippers. That is, drip, dripper space, place that uh, specific spaces inside in the drip line, it became clear that it can be used for annual crops or seasonal crops which are planted close to each other. That is called the raw crops, sugarcane, for example, a, a, a row of brinjals, a row of tomatoes, for example. Now here what happens is that based on the crop size, that is the top part of the canopy, the canopy size, and Avoiding just to avoid competition between two plants in a crop, neighboring two plants in a row, plant spacing was decided. And usually, crop spacing, that is a row spacing and plant to plant spacing, are decided after conducting agronomic trials, experiments with the different spacing, and then finding out where the yield comes to the maximum. And if you increase the population further, the number of plants further, or bringing them closer, the yield becomes less. So there is an optimum point there. That was the that is the way it is decided. But drip irrigation, when it is to be put in every um, uh, root system, close to the root system, it created an issue there. For example, imagine in a meter width uh, land, one meter width the land any length also, doesn't matter. We have three rows of tomatoes. Then we have four rows or five rows of, five rows of onion. In such situation, if you just look at the crop alone, what used to happen is that put a drip line for every row. So there is no question of any, any decision making. Put a, Put a drip line, but then this has skyrocketed the pricing and the amount of plastic which is deposited on the ground. So then later it was found it is not useful. And in fact, this is the time in my uh, experience, I started working into the uh, uh, drip irrigation in a more um, uh, scientific way, try to do. The idea of a soil lateral movement of water, water moving in the soil on a lateral uh, fashion, that is surface spread is not actually been utilized in deciding the drip line spacing. Simply the row to row distance is used as the drip line spacing. Now, once we started understanding water is actually moving, you don't have to put in a closely planted row crop, you don't have to put drip line on every row. Then the real sense came of the drip line utility versus the soil texture. So in a clay soil, like we, if you recollect what I said in the first, uh, as you can, first class, you can keep the drip lines at wider apart as much as possible so that the drip water spread from one dripper will not overlap the one from the next dripper, will only quietly join each other. Similarly, drip line to drip line, the water spread will only join each other. They don't overlap. Overlapping is a waste. So considering the soil type, considering the plant spacing, 
Reclaim spacing can be changed. And this knowledge is what is helping. I'll explain that in a very simple diagram here. Now on the left side, we have drip lateral. There are several rows of crops. Those are round oval shaped the things are representing a crop plant. And the lines are the lateral drip wipe. And uh, here are the plants rows are one meter wide, one meter between each other. And uh, just for example, you have taken an eight meter length in this case. Length of this not uh, important criteria for what I'm trying to explain. Now, for every row on the left side, we have a drip line. Because the plants are planted one meter wide, and then drip line is actually uh, even to every row. Now, in, if we do that, we are putting about um, 10,000 meter lateral in a hectare. If you just take 100 meter, 100 meter uh, square as one hectare. I mean, whichever way you do. It comes about 10,000 meter hectare per hectare. This is too much lateral material, plastic material in the ground. And suppose the soil is uh, clay, or suppose the soil is a loam, clay loam, or uh, even uh, uh, fine sand and loam, and silt and uh, uh, clay together. This is found to be a wastage of material and also money because you are paying more. 10,000 meter per hectare lateral. Not only that, you are paying the supply line, the main conveyance line and the sub, sub main conveyance lines are also have to be larger in diameter. You are paying for more the uh, pipe. And you are also paying for higher for the filtration system. You need a higher, higher capacity filtration system. So everywhere and including your pump has to be because you have to pump more water because there are more dripping points in the reactor. So it is all connected like a chain reaction. Now look at the right side of the picture. The right side, what happens is that these two rows are slightly changed. And we have put between the two rows, instead of old one meter, it's only 0.7 meter now. Knowing very well that the crop will not have much of a deleterious or negative effect because of this. And then we put the drip line. After knowing that, the drip line on either side will give 35 centimeter, 0.35 meter spread of water. So two rows can be regated if you are pairing it actually. You are putting two rows and one drip line. Then two rows, one drip line in the middle. If you do that, you are reducing to 5,000 meter per hectare. Lateral tubing, lateral tubing, lateral tubing. Very good, because you reduce by half. Proportionately reduce not only this, the pipe size, uh, the, the conveyance pipelines, probably the filter size, probably the pump size, the pump capacity, the HP, or the energy. So it is connected to a lot. Now, to decide this, to put it, put the crop between so in the seven meter instead of the old one meter, we should know that that crop, say, say it is chili crop or it is a tomato crop, for example, we should have a good idea about the crops canopy spread during its growth. This is why agronomist comes into the picture. He decides that it's possible. It need not be one meter because you, you waste space, open space. You bring closer. You can be 0 0.7 meter, seven uh, meter, which is 70 centimeter. Then the second thing you should know that the soil type, the soil type, whether it will allow, if you put a drip line in the middle, from the drip line to either side, 35 centimeters, the water should move. Whether it moves, that's based on the soil texture. So the knowledge about the soil texture and the knowledge about the plant canopy size and the competition, because what happens is that now we have accommodating plants closer, closer. And we, that 30 centimeter extra, which we got, we used it as um, the space between two pairs of row. Two pairs of row, you can see 1.3 meter. One of the uh, second row and the third row of plants, it is 1.3 meter. So the land is the same. In this case, population has not changed. Numbers more or less uh, same. But in, if you take a long tender hectare, you will see the number of plants are becoming lesser. I will address this issue in a different way. Later it will come. So you are creating a situation where the first you reduce the drip material in the field. 
and concomitantly it reduces the cost the system but all this happens while the crop with a lesser population now on the land will give the yield either more than its past uh, one meter spacing case or equivalent to the yield so this is the key this issue you have to actually do by field trial you decide this in this case we have not made much change in the population but there are cases population can be a little uh, short or smaller as i go ahead with the uh, presentation you will understand i have some live examples using base i will show you how this is and then what you adjust there how you adjust that situation also okay the point here is instead of having every row having every crop row having a drip line here we have given two rows and one drip line the material is reduced the cost is reduced so that's why drip lateral placement and crop geometry are related and we have to make use of the relationship considering the yield and the relation between plant population considering the spacing of the rows and the drip lateral spacing considering the water spread from each dripper and because that is affected by the soil texture considering the soil texture you place the uh, i just keep uh, highlight a point more here suppose this field had been highly sandy you may not get 35 cm lateral movement so what you do with that you cannot have drip line and the crop line with a gap of 35 cm in a sandy soil i'll come to that situation later and at that time you will find it out as you come along with me now we have uh, i have just taken an example of a row crop the row spacing 0.9 that is a 90 cm 9.9 meter you need a drip line length of 11500 meter per hectare like that 1.2 meter 1.5 meter 1.8 meter and 1.95 so different so as you increase the row spacing it is understood that the drip line spacing can be changed that's one thing row spacing of the crop you can increase but there is a limit you cannot keep on increasing to have only five rows in a hectare you don't get anything to harvest so it is up to the that optimization depends upon field trials conducted at different spaces why I'm saying so with the confidence is that we have done all these in terms of sugarcane, uh, along with um, several sugarcane farmers cooperating, so that we could get the optimum spacing. Now, this crop spacing has got an interesting uh, component, especially in the Indian situation. In the Indian situation of government assisting farmers providing financial subsidies for the cost price on the cost price of the drip irrigation. They want. They looked at the equity of the process. If, if a farmer, suppose, maybe farmer from one region, they always plant, for example, a row crop like sugarcane at uh, 90 centimeter spacing. They will not change 90 centimeter, 90 centimeter, 90 centimeter, and they insist that I must get drip lines also at 90 centimeter. In another region of the country where the farmers grow sugarcane at 1.5 meter row spacing. And then they say that we it's okay for us 1.5 meter give us the lateral then government cannot have a policy on this so what they have done is that it all happened long back actually in the late uh, 90s and early uh, 2000 uh, government engineering department under the horticulture department sat with the design engineers from the different uh, companies as well as experts from the uh, government institutions and they decided the optimum space to which subsidy can be granted okay so they have decided for certain on a basis of the crop or basis of the region basis of the soil they have considered some of the factors which i am going in detail in a in a lesser critical way but the cost of the system as the primary factor because 
and when that was implemented there were difficulties people were made representations to the government to change the spacing for example in uh, i remember in andhra pradesh under the scheme from 1.6 meter lateral we had to bring it down bring it down that is reduce the lateral spacing that will recline spacing 1.5 or 1.2 etc it happened anyway that is because government wants to give subsidy to maximum number of people so that's why they put a land ceiling how much area how much uh, acreage they can get subsidy and beyond that there's no subsidy similarly the spacing etc let us not dwell into that let us look at the science part of it basically from the science part of this row spacing if you look at it has to be decided based on no loss to yield that's the point and while providing drip irrigation drip, drip lines we then decide whether we should give every row in certain crops it is required so actually in some crops like banana and all that two drip lines are required per row that also we will come, we'll come to that actually we will we'll come to that point or whether the yield reduction is not very high because the population when the road rows are tampered with and you going to higher and higher uh, row spacing you get uh, lesser and lesser population so you can do adjustments of course. so the point is very clear if you are put recommending for a drip line spacing you should consider the crops canopy the soil type and the dripper line dripper to dripper line spa uh, dripper spacing and the discharge all these three has to be considered crop geometry can be changed like a single row we can be made to paired row i will talk about that later also but this has to be done all this has to be done with the correct scientific input and information available that's the point i want to drive home now now let's look at the evolution of paired row planting i'm now this is actually i call it as a gift from drip irrigation technology because i was um, i happened to be involved from the right in the beginning of this mainly the crop we considered here is sugarcane with the introduction of drip irrigation precise application of water to the right place at right time in right quantity became a reality obviously i think i have already dealt with it yesterday in the in the first lecture this enabled defining water spread area and thus necessary space between two root spheres of adjacent plants in a row which is not totally planned departing from the traditional practice of irrigation channels yeah we don't need channels now at all for water flow because if water is taken to every row or every two rows by drip line along each row of plants now farmers had a choice to optimize irrigation by suiting the root spread of each species farmers may not know it also they understand it when they see it but it is done by the design engineer and the agronomist to do that paired row planting evolved as a relatively new technology at that time for planting and the main purpose is to optimize the quantum of lateral pipe used for uh, the lateral spread of the wetting bulb from an emitter in each soil type is considered as the basis along with the canopy of the plant that is how the uh, evolution of paired row came instead of every row having a drip line two plant rows pair rows are planted on either side of the drip line so that both root spheres both rows their root spheres are within the wetting span of that one drip line this is the principle in addition to higher yield in the, interestingly when this had happened in addition to higher yield over single row planting for example the case is sugarcane there are a number of advantages of this method like higher plant population came in than single row planting lesser expenses on drip lateral which is obvious and more exposure of plants to sunlight between the wider the in the paired row you have two pairs and a space between the two pairs which is much bigger than the space between the two individual rows in a pair so sunlight penetration into the crop especially in sugarcane that helped uh, into the uh, reaching even to the lower leaves and good air circulation in the field 
which sometimes even reduces the incidence of pests. All of these contributed to the productivity. If one is interested, they can analyze it by having uh, comparative experiments in the field. So, why it is called a gift to and irrigation technology is that even though this can be done, and I have an interesting story, when we successfully did this liquid irrigation, in the early years, farmers of sugarcane who doesn't want to buy drip irrigation also went for paired row that is bringing two rows closer and then wider space then the next pair that method even with the furrow irrigation that's the interesting thing they understood that they understood all the all the plus points except that drip irrigation has to be used but now it's all changed everybody understands about it so pairing the rows crop rows change the crop geometry Whatever may be your objective, it resulted in, with a combination of several factors, sociological factors, economic factors, the cost factor, it resulted in higher productivity, so the technology was accepted. This is what I'm talking about. What's a paired row? This is actually for sugar cane. The green spots are the cane plants, and the black line is the drip line. And uh, between two drip lines, we have 195 centimeter right? So 0.75 is the spacing between two rows in a pair. And 120 centimeter is the pair to pair distance. So this will help you to understand paired row is not skip row. In skip row, you will have four rows and to two drip lines on the first one and the second and the third one, so the intermediate rows will get water from the drip. That's a skip row. I'm not talking about skip row at all. Here, two pairs are there. In the pair, the members are closer, and the two pairs are separated by 120 centimeter, four feet. So this is actually, and two drip line. So in the drip line, I will do the uh, economics of the drip line in the next slide. First, please understand this. That's what a paired row. In terms of sugar cane, it can be used in. Uh, Certain cases in tomatoes, chilies, capsicums, many of the raw crops also it can be used. But in sugar cane, it is successfully used, and also a lot of research is done for the eva evaluating the value of the uh, value of the space. Now, economy of optimizing reply by doing this. Conventionally, single row of sugar cane is planted at a 0.9 meter rows, that is three feet, three feet, three feet. We need about lateral length. If you are doing every row is lateral, suppose it is sandy soil, you need to put every row, then you have 11,250 meter lateral hectare. But when you do skip row, suppose your soil is not sandy, it is a loamy soil, which means clay content is more compared to a sandy soil, clay addition is more, then you can help uh, put drip line in alternate rows, not every row, alternate rows. It's also practiced, but Crop row remains 90 centimeter. Lateral length of the skip row is totally required is 5,625 meter per hectare. Ah, okay. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something else, which is the paired row of sugar cane, which is 0 0.75, 1 0 0.5, 0 0.75 in this case. That is 75 centimeter between two rows of sugar cane, two rows in a pair, and then 1.5 meter. In the figure above, we have seen 1.2 meter, but in the comparison, I have used another geometry. It is 1.5 meter, still wider. In a heavier soil, it is possible, in a clay soil. With a 0.75 meter, the next row. So, lateral length become 4,500 meter per hectare. And the savings in lateral, if you compare with the lateral above, that is a single row planting, it is 6,750. But in the single row case, you do skip row and then compare, you still have a saving of 1,125 meters. Because this is unnecessary plastic being in the field, doing nothing. It's a cost increases, the plastic is thrown into the field. That's it. So this opti this is the one of the major change happened, for example, in sugarcane cultivation. And this is actually a pointer, this is an indicator. The similar changes can be done in many other rock. There is another way of looking at it. Now this figure will show you that. 
This is our evolutionary change in crop spacing and plant population and their productivity also. You look at the left side. Left side is also onion field where wider canals or furrows uh, will bring the water through flow. Then the ridges, on either side of the ridges, touching the water level, onion seedlings are planted. That's what this uh, labor is doing. Now in the other, the right side, there's nothing like this. This is slightly heavier soil, clay content is there. So we found that if you make a 1.5, 1 meter bed, you can put one drip line and then give a walking space, 20 centimeter. So 1.2 meter to 1.2 meter, for example. Between the two drip lines, each bed will have one drip line. And uh, you can have 10 centimeter spacing for onion. It has been standardized. This is the uh, uh, red onion, uh, or even white color onion, uh, what we call in India, the Pellari onion. Okay. This is the way it is done. Now, there are a lot of things in these two figures when you compare. Please read through. micro irrigation, when adopted, provides opportunities on well-designed changes in the way we do farming. We change a lot. Here, water is not allowed to flow through channels in the field. So the very idea that field channels are not a requisite has released a lot of unplanted portions of the field for cropping. That's what happened. The first thing happened was, if you look at the left hand side, a lot of land is utilized for growing water and the lesser portion of the land is used for planting, actually for the plants to stand. For instance, I did the um, modification of this. In onion, conventionally, two thirds of the total land area used to occupy water channels. Imagine if you do one hectare, two thirds of the one hectare is actually flowing water only. That space, no onion plants. And one third had onion plants there. When we change this, when replaters were placed on beds and on onion plants, as a result, we increase the population of onion. When you increase the population of onion, you are also increasing yield, no doubt about it. From 67,000 per acre, for people who do not follow acre, 2.5 acre is actually one hectare. So if you multiply 67,000 with the 2.5, you get per hectare value, per hectare population. Anyway, 67,000, the point I'm making is 67,000 per acre crop population is changed to 2.5 lakh, which is 0.25 million plants per acre. 0.25 million plants per acre. In other words, 67,000 has changed to 0.25 million plants per acre. Similarly, as a result of this, the yield, apart water saving is there, energy saving is there, labor saving is there, a lot of things. Simply the yield from six to seven tons per acre moved to 10 to 14 tons per acre, based on the other management, crop, crop management, fertilizer management. This is actually field research in several onion growing areas by Jane irrigation. And I have uh, been collecting data from and the rest is history. Farmers easily adopted the right hand side easily for this price. Just because they, 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 these, these onions are grown where rainfall is um, not enough and then um, uh, also the best, for best quality they grow in the, um, in the second season, we call it the, the September, so October, September, October sowing to January harvest season, when, where there is uh, lesser rain in India. And water availability in that regions like in Maharashtra, like in Madhya Pradesh, like in Tamil Nadu, are also very low. So you don't have water luxury to have the right hand, the left hand side picture, that method to follow anymore. The right hand side is there. So this is one, this happened because of the introduction of drip irrigation. That is why it's a revolutionary change. Crop geometry change, plant population change, yields almost doubled. And Apart from this, the drudgery of planting, because in this right side, you can plant with the machines. You don't have so many labor, women, bending and planting, and bending and even harvesting later. Okay, so a lot of things changed. So basically what I'm saying, the basic change we brought in by the crop geometry, knowing that drip will spread water to that extent. So you can have one meter bed, and on the bed, 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter spacing, you can plant on it. 
saved a lot of land from becoming simply water flowing and unprotective into protective. That also happened. It's a very interesting case. So this is the way, this is only an indication. Any crop, wherever you are planting, look at the crop, look at the canopy and the population available and the population you think it is better or better off, you can change it. Provided you know thoroughly about the soil and the mold system. This is another interesting case. This is a case of, I have fully got involved in this because when we had this large project in the uh, northern district of um, Bagalkot in Karnataka, because the project insisted the drippers, dripper lines you are providing will be given only at 1.52 meter. That's what you see. You cannot have, the project is giving to the farmers as part of the government funded project they are giving. So, but the farmers wanted to do different crops and also as a technology provider, we were asked to introduce high value crops remove the, uh, replace the crops which they are currently growing, pearl millets and uh, what we call very low value grain crops. We were then introducing high value crop like maize, sunflower, pigeon peas, vegetables, a lot of crops, chilies and high value uh, uh, safflower crops, example. Now, the first difficulty we had was the soil there is the top soil especially will allow very little water movement laterally. It may appear black, but it's not clay soil. It has got a lot of uh, what the material we call in India, the muram, the large size particles of uh, stony particles on the top soil. So the water that movement is restricted. In a conventional case, what happened? If you, you can, the maximum you can get is only 15 centimeter on either side of the lateral line. So farmers, what they thought you can do with each drip line, you plant uh, two rows of maize instead of the single row. They, they improved a bit, two rows of maize. And there's a very wide gap between the two rows, between the pairs, okay, in this case. Now, when I, I was studying this problem, I realized that uh, the mice population is considerably reduced. So the yield which they are going to realize because of the water restriction, movement restriction in the soil, you will not be able to get an yield equivalent to the conventional, ir conventionally irrigated maize crop yield, which means farmers may not like to have maize or like to go for any high value crop because of this problem. So what we did was thinking of taking all these measurements and all that, we tried to change it. Now you can see on the right hand picture, the same location, the drip line is the same, the spacing between two drip line is also the same. What I introduced is one more row, that is three rows of maize. In a way, there is a bit of crowding and you look at it, but as the maize grows up, later we found the population and the canopy, canopy adjusts to the the space between the two groups, that is the wider space which you see, and the close-up diagram you will see how the um, three on the right-hand side, how the three lines are aligned. One line is closer to the drip line, then the two lines are two rows of uh, two rows of um, base plants are 15 centimeter from the center point on either side. So population has gone from two to three times two times because two rows three times now so this is one way of adjusting so we change the crop geometry that is the way we change the crop geometry we brought down the row to row spacing to 15 centimeter from whatever it was originally and increased slightly the plant to plant spacing actually if you imagine row to row and plant to plant these two spacings are at a right angle to at right angles to each other. You just try to rotate it. In your, in, you can visualize it. When you rotate it, you can see that the plant to plant spacing can become the row to row spacing, and the row to row spacing can become plant to plant spacing. Anyway, 
uh, don't go too much into the into the, the theoretical part then the result is here to see maize grew very well and very high yields of maize is produced this is one way when prefiguration lines cannot be given as per the soil type but it is decided by the funding agency so because they want to cover larger area so they want to minimize or in a way of speaking minimize the requirement of material so the cost will be more farmers will be served that's sort of thing so this is the way it is been handled now one of the case is that we have to make sure the root spread of the crop will get if you remember on the first lecture the surface spread of the water has to match with the root spread i mentioned this similarly the percolation rate how much it goes deeper will also that is secondary actually because most of the absorption takes place at uh, 40 cm on the surface in a well prepared soil even though some roots are extending to about uh, 60 even 80 cm so but the spread of the the lateral spread of the um, root system has to be considered to be wetted now you see the the one on the left side we have a ginger crop on ridges placed at 1.2 meter sorry 1.5 meter each the ridge top to ridge top is 1.5 meter lateral to lateral the lateral is 1.5 see how it grows with the when you adjust the rows of ginger that can be planted it almost covered leaving a narrow space for the people to walk for a different op form operations and observation of the crop so the canopy has even though we changed the spacing the canopy space has been adjusted to the lateral space that also can happen so this is where a thorough agronomy knowledge about the crop growth growth and the final formation of the uh, canopy is important not only the top canopy that's what i'm showing you the picture on my uh, right hand side of the banana banana actually grows these bananas are planted at um, six feet between rows which is um, 1.8 meter one banana to the other on the right hand side left to right is one point. similarly plant to plant and so in this case is um, the same space now here if you give only one lateral and banana root side as i mentioned yesterday they are very much on the surface first 30 centimeters so we get a lots of roots with a very good root air development and absorption capacity these roots have to be wetted uniformly one single line on one side in that particular soil will now as the banana grows its water requirement decreases and the wetting has to be uniform on either side so there we have to give two drip line that's the idea so that on either side the elevated portion you know in a way of the bed around the trees will be kept wet so banana will yield very well there's absolutely no water will come in the in the row water space when you do it properly as per the evapotranspiration now you know the sunflower picture which i showed you is exactly like the ginger there the sunflower with just leaves a gap for people to walk and there are two rows of sunflower between two rows is the uh, drip line now coming back to the citrus and the coconut why i have shown this is that these are with a large expanded uh, root rhizosphere and the uh, absorbing root will be about uh, half a meter to 1 meter away from the trunk so you have a larger circumference to be wetted if you want to get appro appropriate uh, yield and uh, soil wetness so there we introduce a different type you have a a linear line of drip line or a hollow tube coming and the drip line is made the drippers are inside or outside it doesn't matter the drip inside the tube or outside the tube that drip line forms a loop around the this is the typical way for example citrus in this case is irrigated this is also one other it was also can be irrigated with a double double lateral like in the banana but here we are saving a bit more on the lateral a bit more on the drip line but without affecting the trees so there is one say the same thing in the coconut it's called a loop around the tree now we are coming to uh, another interesting thing 
generally when cotton is planted these are uh, the indian cotton species uh, whether it is uh, advanced material from the private co seed companies or even the local what happens is that they have they grow large they are not like the puma cotton which you see in the in the us and all that they grow very tall and branched so they have a fixed spacing in this case it is 1.2 meter on a, a row to row and then you have a drip line one each one so this is the way it is to be grown and the soil as you can see there's a lot of stones and there on the moram so you cannot have one drip line with the two rows of cotton in the left hand diagram so is on the right hand side same thing same thing even though the soil color is different one is reddish the other is blackish the soil uh, clay content is less in the yeah, right hand side so we follow that but when the moment the soil is different and you get a shorter version of corn, that is the growth pattern, you can bring cotton onto a bad situation. You can see of the lower picture, one drip line with the two rows of cotton on either side. Okay. The bed is 1.2 meter or 1 meter or 1.2 meter wide. That depends upon the soil type. And then each one has got one drip line. And successfully grown two, two rows of cotton so that you have reduced the case the, but these are in two different cases and uh, this locational difference mainly attributed to first the growth habit of care of the cotton whether it is large branching or short ones with the less branching and uh, uh, less canopy size to the soil type the soil type so these two things both are being utilized. That's why I gave this example to understand that. By doing the field research on a continuous basis and trials and uh, learning this from a different, we have come up with the tomatoes with the paired row can be done, potato can be done with the paired row, and you have an yield increase uh, across the different uh, ecologies, different locations, about 50 to 60 percent tomato, 20 to 30 percent potato. And what concomitantly there is of course the water saving is also there because the drip always uses less water than the flood irrigation. Brinjal, but it has to be single row for its own reason because it will have an open umbrella type of canopy so that even if the plant at the base looks uh, uh, less wide, as it comes to the top, it spreads. So when because you cannot then accommodate two, two, two crops together, two plants together. Chili, same cauliflower, a paired row is possible, cabbage, paired row is possible. Bottle gourd, French bean, okra. So these are all actual field practice, which we are, I'm writing it down to show you how these uh, things are now. Now we are coming to a stage. At least I have been working on this now about 20, 25 years on this. And then uh, based on what other people have, it's a question of um, a total scientific history about 40, 45 years. Now we have uh, come to a very good conclusion of e for each crop, unless they bring up a short type of crop canopy with uh, high flowering uh that means less vegetative matter more protein, all that comes we can always adjust to that new situation of a hybrid or a variety selling but this is how it is done now there is the other side what happens when you have a pre-planted like on the left hand side on a sandy soil and then you the tree grows at a large, uh, become a large canopy. The root spread also is large. So you have to plan the tree on the left side also will grow whatever the species. For the, forget it's one the light left hand side is pomegranate, right hand side is citrus. That is not the point I'm making. The left hand side of pomegranate will also grow big and cover the inner space between the two rows and the two plants. So we are to take the decision initially when you are planning for drip irrigation even though the left hand side picture the trees can be irrigated with a single drip line later when they are five year old six year old and beyond they have to have wider spacing of the sandy soil getting wet so the decision you cannot redesign a drip irrigation okay you can re-establish a new drip irrigation system but that is very costly you have to plan in the beginning of the crop what would be the later stages of the crop and provide two drip lines. Now the two drip lines are closer to the tree. But later, just giving an example, you can widen the drip lines. The drip lines are already there. 
so that the uh, increased the root rhizosphere area or the volume will be catered to by the provision of water by the drip irrigation. That's what that's what this shows the drip lines with the root spread. Another interesting thing is that you have many places, many farmers, when the drip irrigation system has gone into agriculture, along with that came several challenges. One of the challenges is intercrop. Farmers do plant, like here you can see on the left hand side, two separate crops are there. One is the PGNP, the narrow leaf one. The other one is actually a cauliflower crop in the younger stage, uh, which is coming up. So this is an intercrop. Even this farmer needs uh, drip irrigation. So obviously, each of the row will have a different drip line because the soil type is like that. There is one more complication. The irrigation scheduling of crop A, which is region B, and the crop B, which is in this case, um, the core crop, the cauliflower, they are different. Their ages are different, their growth rate is different, their crop duration is different. And one more thing which I didn't bring in so far, their fertilizer requirement through fertigation is also different. So what you do? You are replying, if it are all of them are attached to the same submain, I actually put a model diagram on the right side for you to understand. This is the submain pipe from where the drip line start. And this is the main line pipe. The main line and one submain is given an example and on the drip line you have the crops. So if you give one submain, same amount of water and uh, whatever fertilizer you're injecting in the fertilizer injector here on the top, here will actually move down. It will supply to both crops equally, but that is not what, is, what you require. So basically this can be solved, this situation, this challenge can be solved by providing have another valve from the main line and another submain. So when you are actually growing, uh, irrigating, suppose the amount of water required for PGNP and the amount of cauliflower water required for cauliflower can be controlled separately. Similarly, their fertigation can be controlled. You fertigate first only cauliflower. So you apply, you open the valve controlling the cauliflower drip lines on the submain side, the main submain connection, and then apply fertigation. When you complete that, you open the submain which supplies the drip lines to the PGNP and close the other one and do the fertigation separately. So this is how the challenge is made. So this is a very interesting case, intercrop. See, basically what we are trying to do is that whatever method of crop rotation, crop drip line rotation I'm coming to later, uh, intercrop, in a field where the farmer wants to do to optimize his income, uh, in a way of speaking, maximize his income, we had to accommodate by making changes in the drip irrigation system when you design it and implement it. In this case, the change is provide drip lines separate on separate submain pipe to, to, to the two different crops. That's one way. Or you can have drip, each drip line having a valve. And, uh, but that is cumbersome because you have to close all PGNP drip line valves at the point of the submain and open only the cauliflower drip line. But then this labor is uh, involved. So one time uses one valve, two main, two submains, each one with a valve, Open only the PGNP valve, run the PGNP irrigation fertigation, open the cauliflower valve, submain valve, then run the irrigation. That is the most optimum way of and successful way of doing this. I like that now we have to understand where in, in India, for example, several states, several regions within the state where the crop patterns are different based on climate, based on ancestral history, that is the practice they have, or based on how much science has intervened and crop changes, crop diversification happened. All these types. So you can have a cotton to wheat. Now here we are talking about rotation. Rotation means after one crop, say for example, the rainy season, June to September, you are growing cotton crop. Then in the same land, you prepare 
and you grow wheat crop in the coming season that is october to january or you can even have one more rotation third one in the summer that is if you have enough water and irrigation system ready and then you you are financially well off to spend on fertilizer and all that you can get a truly in the summer with a very little or no rainfall and your water source is supporting you you can have a third crop so the irrigation will be the same the drip system which is kept for the cotton crop will be the same for wheat crop but your irrigation scheduling how much water when will change how much fertilizer which nutrient when will also change so you have to provide the software repeatedly to the crop uh, to the farmer and he will practice it based on the crop initially cotton first three three four, four and four and a half months then the wheat then he may leave the land fallow that's only time the drip line may remain he will roll it up and keep it safely and then treat it bad wet it or do an acid injection as per our requirement to for the health of the drippers then put it back have the next bottom drop in the year that is how it is done so and also some remarks are given even the wheat can be grown with a sprinkler system this is a decision sometimes government makes for the farmer or the farmer also makes because sprinkler also attracts financial help and sprinkler if you, especially if you have shifting sprinkler if you're 10 hectare you don't need 10 hectare completely covered with sprinkler sprinkler one line or two lines you keep shifting at the required spacing of the sprinkler so that you get the overlap of water from one sprinkler line to the other and the entire field would be wetted okay wheat it is suitable but if you are buying a sprinkler for wheat you cannot use it for cotton it's just not suitable you get uh, because it is um, uh, racimos flowering habit and uh, the flowers will keep coming till the crop comes its uh, termination so at any point of time when you are sprinkling you will be causing uh, not only pollen wash and the lack of food formation it happens in several other crops you will also create uh, high humidity on the, uh, and you get diseases and insects and a lot of things so cotton is not a sprinkler friendly crop it is a drip friendly crop and because even though your wheat can be grown either on drip or when your decision is to go for drip irrigation. that's also i have uh, conveyed through this uh, thing. now you have sugarcane sugarcane because it's a 12 month crop or a nine month crop in north india for example or other places uh, some, some places in maharashtra it is a 16 month crop so you have a continuous one so drip potato and cotton very nice potato is actually you grow during the um, rabi season which is september october november october november season and then you grow a cotton in the summer or cotton in the rainy season so you have uh, the problem potato can be grown on uh, sprinkler but cotton is the reason so this decision making of the appropriate system is done by the company agronomist after discussion with the farmer make him understand what is his crop planning so right now the technology is at a stage that you are not giving irrigation system for a crop totally in the agriculture crops any of you i'm not talking about the mango or chard or uh, uh, citrus or chard case here i'm talking about annual crops seasonal crops keep changing so if your system can be adjusted and to accommodate the rotation crops that's exactly you are getting high returns from the investment you made on the system so farmer may buy drip irrigation for cotton but with that changes what are the changes required you don't have much changes on the uh, spacing there your changes are on the irrigation scheduling and fertigation scheduling which you have to supply separate for the incoming crop of cotton for wheat if it is cotton starting crop then the wheat like that then you have even three crop rotation potato tobacco and maize can be adjusted on the same drip line because farmers generally at that time maybe few years some 10 15 years ago they used to think like that even some administrators i remember discussing think that if you buy for potato then you want to change it to maize you have to change the system you don't have to change the system only the software which is the irrigation scheduling and the um, fertigation scheduling you need to change the same system can be used and the agronomist will help you to readjust the population because potato planting pattern crop geometry is not same as maize you can change it based on the soil the agronomist will help you so right now if you make an investment on of drip irrigation for one crop the same system will be used in intercrop situation where you have two crops at the same time or in a rotation crop or 
where a crop is followed by another crop. That's the point I'm making. So one full year value return on your investment you can get by having this system. This is very important. World over, it is going to be important, especially those countries who are waiting to adopt this technology in large scale. Please understand this. In the beginning, you can start doing this. So the, some of the mistakes we went through in India, for example, uh, in the early 80s, uh, etc., we can avoid. Muscalon cotton, then we have a sugarcane, wheat, there's an entering crop of wheat, then sugarcane comes back. You grow sugarcane, harvest, then you give a wheat crop, it's very easy, especially if you have a no-till, you can give that, and the sugarcane plant again. So, interesting things are available. Now, maize, maize, wheat. So, several combinations, whatever combinations of rotation I have come across, or I have technically given inputs to accommodate them, I have just listed here. Now, there is another phase I'm now talking. I'm not talking about the crop spacing here. I'm talking about in the soil plant water relations, we understand the soil remain after all this, the drip irrigation provides water to the soil only. Because we are not putting the roots to the dripper inside and get it the water. So the soil moisture has to be conserved. By dripping, we are conserving already. We can do that one more layer of conservation. This is what it is. Even though mulching with the plastic mulch, the left hand side is peach and pea grown on that, and the right hand side uh, is actually a crop of melon coming on that. We can do this. Here, what happened? The drip line, when the water is spread down to the soil and some water percolated, it is prevented from getting exposed to direct sunlight. So, the evaporation component you are reducing. You are allowing the water as much as possible to escape only through the crop system. In other words, the ET component, evapotranspiration, you are trying to reduce as much as possible the E component and uh, maintain the T component. The crop grows very well. And your input is B. It has other benefits like the weeds won't come and uh, for certain amount of treatment, etc. Because please understand that line is below the plastic mulch. One other thing I want to tell you is that you look at the soil on the uh, left hand uh, picture. The crop is growing excellent, which means not water stress. It's getting its water through the, from the roots, through the roots, because that is where the irrigation line is between the two rows of um, pig and pea. But on your right, right, right side, lower bottom of that picture, you look at the soil. It is dry. It is already started having when the clay soil, this is a clay, black clay, dirty soil, it will crack. You can see the cracks on the side. What it means is that even though the irrigation process is taking place where the rhizosphere is located, no water is actually coming. It's a beautifully designed, well designed drip irrigation system, well chosen drip line, well chosen emitting rate, well chosen dripper to dripper spacing. You don't see any wetness on the on the side here, the water is not coming. Unless, of course, you can do it by, and also well-maintained irrigation scheduling by the farmer. Because technically, we give very scientifically estimated irrigation scheduling, but one can always overrun it. Instead of, suppose, today morning, you should apply only two hours. If you say, it asks for four hours, then the water will come on that. But it is well, it is understanding of the, Irrigation technology, the irrigation technology, irrigation schedule is also the superb activity. This is how the crop should be grown in the advance. This is optimizing crop water use further. Now we are coming back, coming, going ahead actually, with the, another intervention in this technology of crop geometry plus placement of lateral, uh, drip lateral. This is sub, from the surface irrigation technology to the subsurface. So far, we were talking about paired row or skip row uh, or um, a single row. Drip lines are always on the top of the subsoil surface. Now, for different reasons of uh, mechanization, in this case, we got, I'm going to talk about sugarcane actually. Mechanization, they want, sugarcane growers want to introduce harvesters, sugarcane harvesters, because highly labor intensive. Many places, the labor is not available. Timely harvest does not take place. Crop results in a loss. 
So they, in, when they want to introduce, they cannot afford to have the tripoline on the surface, and uh, because the harvesters will destroy them. So either you have to have a very low cost, very thin fill, uh, wall material on the surface, and you agree to uh, to lose lose it with the harvest of the first crop, or you can put it because sugarcane is not a crop of that type. Sugarcane can be retuned. After cutting it, it will germinate again if you provide water irrigation immediately after cutting. So that is a retune crop. So many farmers, especially in India, they go for multiple retuning, two or three or sometimes five and seven. That many numbers. So five and seven years, you don't have to replant it. That's the idea. Anyway, I'm not talking about retuning part much. When the mechanization came in there, ripper tubes have to be not there, should not be there on the surface, but still operations have to take place. That's what we have done. So here, the drip line is actually below the surface. Now there are many things in this. The spacing is already decided. It's a paired row. Between two, row, between two rows in a pair is about 35 to 40 centimeter variation. I just showed that. And uh, end to end of that a pair is 120 centimeter. So drip line is actually on the 160 centimeter. We are expecting something like a 17.5 to 20 centimeter movement of lateral movement of lat moisture from the drip line. Okay, now the placement of the lateral should be very critical. Please understand, sugarcane is grown in a variety of soils, sandy soil, sandy loam soil, clay loam soil, clay soils. It grows, provided water is managed, fertilizer is managed well. Here, one other thing happens is that sugarcane is not from a seed. It is from a piece of stem. It's called a set, a seed. We'll have two nodes where the buds are located, or sometimes three nodes where the buds are located. Now, the germination of sugarcane set requires continuous presence of moist soil around the bud. Then only the bud will sprout and you get a plant, unlike the seeds. The seeds. You don't need a continuous presence. You get wetting, the seed will absorb, the seed pot will break. It's a different villa. Totally different um, activity taking place. So that, and should not be excess water also for sugarcane to germinate. So the dripper lines generally provide moisture to the two rows of sugarcane planted on either side of it. I'll show you how the lateral separation of the drip line and the um, sugarcane sets or the planting material is maintained and so there's a vertical separation the drip line is on the top many others i know there is a difference of opinion but i have seen them having difficulties also in the sandy soil when you have drip line at the bottom of the drip sets the two sets on either side water capillary is moving up which is they have to move against the gravity and in the sandy soil it is very very difficult they won't germinate so if you have it on the top and then uniformly water with the gravity water moves gently down and reaches the set, you get the best. That's the logic I have used in designing this. And this is probably one of the, uh, I'm highly personally satisfied with this um, uh, drip line placement and the depth of the uh, drip line placement and the lateral uh, distance, of deciding the lateral distance between the cane rows and the drip line, etc. We are successful in this technology. Something like um, uh, 50 to 60,000 hectare in India is, uh, and it's still growing uh, under sub 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 surface and by us. Now, SDR drip line placement, while land, land preparation is important, placement of drip line below specified uh, depths at a deep village uh, depth or any suitable depth would ensure repeated use of the lanterns. So, basically, in sugarcane, it's not important because it is multi cut. It's a retunable crop so that the drip line will always remain the same location and uh, from the top you are cutting the cane and the new cane will form. Placement of drip lines are the aid of any installation equipment. Okay, we are not talking about that. Now, we are talking only the spacing and the depth. Having normal uh, rotavate uh, disc operation, then the rotavator operation, then you have the lateral laying machine. The spacing, for example, normal spacing, six lateral, 4.5, five, 5 feet. Now, there is an interesting thing here. The row spacing or the paired row spacing or the two, the distance between the two pairs 
has got another component to be considered before deciding. That is the which machine, harvesting machine is the what the farmer is using, going to use. We have to ask the question. There are uh, 4.5 feet wide uh, cutters are there on saddle machines. Saddle machines is 5 feet. If you are 5 feet, you are paired row distant. That one pair to the other should be 5 feet. Or it is 4.5 feet, it should be 4.5 feet. Or like that, 6 feet. Okay. So there is a, an added component or added consideration you have to give. That uh, is the what is the make and the cutter, the super cane cutter distances in the mechanical harvest. Hence, that point also is considered. Now, insulation installed about 10 to 15 centimeter below the soil surface, cane about 22 centimeter below the soil, which means the laterally separated as well as vertically separated. We will show in a, in the logic is the roots tend to grow down, they don't grow up. They grow up and the first year and they do not enroll the lateral so it is safety for the lateral they do sometimes at a later stage roots can enter the dripper through the dripper uh, minute holes inside and block it so that's just happening there is a way of blocking it in the later years by applying certain chemicals through the drip system which will protect uh, which will make the roots move away from the drip, dripper hole that is there but we are not going to talk about that now so the logic of keeping the drip line above the sets is good germination because of the gentle moving down of the water. And the initial roots which are coming will not enter into the, uh, into the drip line because the drip line is above, the roots are going down. Now water moves down, we know it. And the depth of 10 to 15 centimeter planting is increased later around three months time in sugarcane all sugarcane growing areas especially in the southern india we have a practice of putting cut the inner row space and put one more or two more layer of soil on top of the cane row which means above they will fall on above the lateral so even though you're plant, planting at planting time it's only 10 to 15 centimeters from the surface down later you will see that maybe sitting at 10 20 centimeter because soil is added to the top that just possible, just uh, practice. It is also accumulated. That practice is accumulated in this. At that time, by the time the roots will be there everywhere, so that uh, the position and the plant is germinated, grown, you don't have a problem of which way the water is moving because the roots will move where the water is. This is exactly what I said. This is the time at planting. The two have opened up the field at the road, the drip line above and laterally it is separated and vertically also it is separated so this is and we found it is a quite successful anywhere in the world it can be uh, now we have uh, just to look at it will allow mechanical uh, interculture you can operate a machine to do the weeding of this side as mechanical interculture between the two rows of cane later you will see at nine months very good cane growth and what they do the dry leaves they remove and put it as a mulch here, again, water saving technology, just to show where the drip line is there, just to show where the drip line is there, and the root system. I have covered a lot of material from my own experience and experiences from my team of agronomists in gen irrigation. Every time we take into a new crop, a farmer make a request to put drip irrigation for a new crop, we study the crop's phenology, growth durations, the size in an optimum growing condition, what would be the size of the canopy, where the roots are located, and what is the recommended row spacing, or can we make a change in that, so the farmer will benefit. When, in many places, when the population changes, like you saw in onion, you get more yield. And then adjust based on the soil type, the drip line spacing, the dripper selection, that is, what discharge you have to select. You need a one liter per hour dripper or a two liter per hour dripper or four liter per hour dripper and the distance between them. So what you might have understood is that there's a lot about application of scientific common knowledge in science to make the system the perf one of the perfect system, which will consider intercropping, rotation cropping, full year use of the system. So now the replication technology has come to that 
devil. For me, it's actually a very satisfying experience. And also, I share through this lecture, apart from personal experience in the field, a lot of collective experience which our Jain irrigation agronomists have collected and still doing it. They are still in the field while I'm talking to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>